various presentations mm -hmm. that we've had over the last few days. There have been several topics that have been covered. The first day was personalized medicine focus, where we kind of focused on 2C19 and Plavix. We talked about uh, KRAS, VRAF, and colorectal cancer. Day two, we switched over to women's health, where we talked about HPV, STD testing as well. And then finally, we wrapped up with the shape of things to come for autogenomics. For today, we're going to have two summary presentations by two distinguished speakers here. Number one, we have Dr. Robert Cole, who will open the presentation speaking about the relevance of black box warning and clopidogrel therapy. He is the chief medical officer of autogenomics, as well as a practicing uh, gynecologist. Uh, additionally, the second presentation will be from Dr. Patrick Dillon, who is the vice president of R&D, and he's going to talk about KRAS, BRAF as a vital tool in cancer therapy. Following Dr. Dillon, Dr. Cole will wrap it up and speak about women's health uh, that, that was covered yesterday, mainly focusing again on HPV and STD testing. So that being said, I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic over to Dr. Cole to begin. I ask that you hold your questions till the end when uh, all the speakers are done and we can address the questions at the end. Thank you. Hello everyone, it's great to be here. We're going to uh, have part two here of uh, pharmacogenomics. We're going to specifically talk about uh, the relevance of the black box warning to clopidogrel therapy. And uh, we'll be kind of going over what we've gone before, go over before, but uh, we'll start again. Now, just a brief introduction. Pharmacogenomics or pharmacogenetics, personalized medicine. The goal is to find the right drug right dose for the right patient. Choice of therapy is predicted by specific gene, genetic changes that can be tested clinically. The clinical go goals of pharmacogenomics are to avoid adverse drug reactions, maximize drug efficacy, select responsive patients, and define individualized drug dose. Now this, this um, graph we've seen before, this picture we've seen before many times, Fundamentally, it's important to understand that when pharma designs a drug, they really design a drug for about maybe 60% of the population. 40% of the population, the, that specific drug is, will either not be effective or will not be effective at that appropriate dose, or in some cases may be toxic. So one of the things that we do with pharmacogenomics is it's, it allows us to test for the metabolic pathways that the patient may have, and that's going to affect how that patient will react with that specific medication. We know that for some patients, the drug may be toxic, but beneficial. In that situation, we want to think about perhaps reducing the dose of that drug. And for other patients, and we're, we'll talk about clopidogrel um, uh, later, is that the, the drug may, is not toxic and uh, not beneficial. but uh, and in that sense, we consider um, a different drug or an increased dose. This is specifically what we're going to be talking about with clopidogrel. The drug can be effective, but at the dose that we're giving it, it may not be effective in the way that we want it to be. Now, let's talk a little bit about the cytochrome P450 system. It's a large family of hemoproteins. There's central importance in metabolizing a large number of endogenous and exogenous molecules. In the liver, these substrates include uh, drugs and toxic compounds. CYPs are the major enzymes involved in drug metabolism and bioactivation. And important to all of this is that the genes that encode the CYP enzymes, which are proteins, are polymorphic. In other words, the polymorphisms that we see um, result in differences from one individual to another in terms of how they metabolize the drug. And we can measure those things actually before we give the patient the drug. Now, the CYP2C19 enzyme is central to the metabolism of a variety of important drugs. Those drugs include antidepressants, anticonvulsants, proton pump inhibitors, cytotoxic agents, beta blockers, antiestrogens, and antimalarials. Now, we're going to go on and talk about a specific drug, clopidogrel, or Plavix. Plavix is known as clopidogrel bisulfate. There are more than 90 million patients worldwide on the drug. The indications for Plavix are acute coronary syndrome. Let's talk about that. We're talking about patients that develop uh, acute chest pain, require an intervention. We're talking about an angiogram or an angioplasty where a stent may be placed in a coronary vessel. The presence of a foreign body can, can exacerbate the potential of a clot to form. 
uh, platelets get uh, irritated by turbulence in these vessels and by foreign bodies. So we want to make sure that those plat platelets do not aggregate and form a clot. A devastating element of this is we understand that in, for many patients, it is this clot formation that is causing a heart attack. We, we want to make sure that we've either removed that clot, lysed that clot, or we have opened up the vessel, and we want to make sure that another clot doesn't form. And those patients are particularly at risk because of the changes that we've caused in the endothelial lining of the blood vessels. So this is a very important thing. We're concerned also about a stent thrombosis. That's the uh, aggregation of platelets in a new stent that's been placed in a coronary vessel. It's important to understand that the size of clot we're talking about is no bigger than a pencil lead. This is not a, this is not a, a, a large clot that we're talking about. So even a minor alteration of blood flow can have a huge uh, impact on the patient's outcome. Also, we, we talk about patients that have had recent heart attacks, recent uh, strokes, and as patients with established peripheral artery disease. So when we talk about Plavix, we're talking about acute intervention, but we're also talking about long-term management. And there have been a, a many studies that have looked at patients that have been a, that have had coronary issues since the age of 40. These patients require long-term Plavix management. We've looked specifically at the polymorphisms that we're going to talk about later, and we found that the incidence of death, the in incidence of, of new heart attacks, is much higher in these people that are exhibiting these polymorphisms because they're not getting the adequate therapy that they need from their present clopidogrel dosing. Now, what is the mechanism of action? Now, a clopidogrel is a prodrug that irreversibly inhibits ADP receptor uh, P2Y12 on the platelet cell membrane. It's important to understand that once the platelet cell membrane has been, uh, that uh, once Plavix, well, let me go back, let me back that truck up for you. When Plavix is taken, it needs to be metabolized to the active form of the drug. Once the active form of the drug binds with that platelet membrane, that receptor site, that platelet is out of commission. It will not function and aggregate the w uh, and operate in the normal cascade that it would operate in. Now, the dosage, our, our standard dosage for people is 75 milligrams, but we can bump patients up to 150 milligrams. Sometimes patients will have some GI complaints, but for the most part, they can, they can tolerate that pretty well without any significant problems. Um, so this is the maintenance dose that we worry about. And we have that kind of, that kind of flexibility in dosage uh, without significant problems. When we look at our loading dose, we can go from 300 milligrams to 600 milligrams. There have been studies, there was a study by Bonello where patients were actually dosed with 2,400 milligrams to achieve the type of platelet effect that we were looking for. So there is flexibility uh, in the way that we want to, in where we want to dose patients. Now, once again, clopidogrel is a prodrug that has to be converted to its active metabolite. CYP2C19 is the key enzyme in this, in this process. 2C19 is polymorphic with multi -var multiple variants, resulting in individuals with reduced ability to convert clopidogrel to the active form of the drug. We know the SNPs that are important here. Uh, the, pr uh, we, uh, the principal reduced function polymorphism, the one that we see the most frequently is star two. Then we have star three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. And then flipping it the other direction, we have star 17. Star 17 is actually, a, those patients have an increased function. They are able to bioconvert more of the drug to the active form. And so those patients, uh, we might consider either reducing the drug, we might, uh, there are a variety of ways that we might uh, I interpret that information. I have a friend of mine, a cardiologist. He likes to evaluate patients that have, there are some patients that can present with GI bleeding, other bleeding problems, ha having been on uh, the standard maintenance dose of Plavix. He evaluates those patients for star 17. And he's found some star 17s. Uh, and he does that if those patients present in the emergency room with any GI bleeding. Now, do these SNPs occur frequently? Actually, they do occur frequently. 30% of Caucasians have, will manifest one of these polymorphisms that will affect their dosing. 40% of African Americans and 55% of Asians. Now, there has been a recent flurry of literature that has focused on the genetic causes of, of the variability and response that we have seen with clopidogrel and how individual variable variability impacts clinical outcome. 
the most famous of these studies was a study that was in the new england journal of medicine by mega last year which really looked at clinical outcome of patients as it relates to those patients that manifest this part of these polymorphisms and those outcomes were not as good those patients are at greater risk for another heart attack there are great they are greater risk for sudden death they're greater they are greater risk for uh, stent thrombosis now the FDA Oh, in the, in the FDA, in reaction to this flurry of new knowledge and understanding about these polymorphisms, published a new warning. They updated this warning in 2010. Uh, basically, what it says is, it's imp and it's important to understand what this black box warning says and what it doesn't say. It says that the knowledge of 2C19 is important. It says that the physician should, if the physician is aware of 2C19, uh, uh, polymorphisms that he may use that information to act on either a, his dosing parad a paradigm or perhaps to choose another drug. It does not go on and say that we require everyone to be evaluated for 2C19. And this is the, the and once it, it, this is one of the wonderful uh, unique elements about medicine. There's always a push pull between literature, new knowledge, and the incorporation of that new knowledge into actual patient management algorithms. Because what happens in response to this is that there, we have c controversy generated and we have thought leaders in the field expressing their opinions about how our regulatory boards are uh, addressing this issue. Now, um, Eric Topol has been a long proponent of pharmacogenomics and he wrote an article in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology um, and I think it was a very well reasoned and a very passionate article about the importance of incorporating uh, these types of tests for patients that are at risk for coronary heart disease and are at risk for sudden death. And I think he makes three important statements in, his, uh, this, uh, in this article that he wrote. He say, states that the evidence threshold supporting individual, individualized clopidogrel therapy has been clearly surpassed. He goes on to say, we cannot afford to wait years for results from trials which have yet to be initiated and that we should implement all potential interventions to help prevent catastrophic outcomes of stent thrombosis and death, death in the tens of thousands of patients currently at risk. Uh, he says a lot of very important things in this article,